I would like to thank very much and introduce our fabulous presenter. I've seen her present a number of times, so I'm not just saying this. She's excellent. Her name is Bernadette Pilar Zemeño, and she is a instructional coach for Fluent Seeds in Oakland. And with that, I am going to turn it. Well, actually, I just one last housekeeping. Um, I want to let folks know that at the end, uh, there will be an evaluation that I'll put a link in the box for the last five minutes. And we will have some time for Q&A afterwards. It's going to be very um, uh, interactive. So there's going to be some breakout rooms time. But please, if you have any questions along the way, throw them in the chat box and we'll get to them at the end. And with no further ado, Ms. Bernadette. Thank you, Jethro. I was just remembering that I had the opportunity of working with Jethro like 10 years ago, back in my first classroom at Bridges Academy. So shout out to Bridges Academy, shout out to Oakland. Um, I My heart is beating so fast because I am just so honored and blessed to be here today. There are uh, The chat is amazing. I know many of you from our community and Oakland, we are such a great powerhouse. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Welcome everyone. As Jethro said, I am from Fluent Seeds. It is always a blessing to be here. Before we start, I would just like to acknowledge the land that we're on. I think we're all Bay Area, but if you're from like Brazil or you're, you're zooming in from any other place, um, also acknowledge the land that you are and that you're on. It's always important to start off any talk with this. And can you imagine the power that you would have for your little ones if you put up this map or the whole United States map? So land recognition is really important, just giving grace and thanks for where we're at. If you want to find out a little bit more about your where you're at or where your school is at, I put it in the chat. Also, sometimes we talk about land recognition, and then if you want to be more action and talk about land reparation, we could check in afterwards or shoot me a direct message on the chat. So thank you. And if you are a parent, if you're an educator, there's a lot going on right in the world today. So I really want to take a moment to ground in. And when we ground in, it helps us connect our mind and our body again. It helps us really relate to everything that we are about to process and learn. I think grounding in is an important step for little ones and adults, especially if you had a morning like me where the, my child couldn't tie the shoes and the shoes were misplaced and then we couldn't find the mask to go to school. So it's nice to just take a moment to pause take some deep breaths and clear your mind before we are uh, before we jump into any learning. So feel free to turn off your screens if you want, find a comfortable comfortable position. We have someone from Pennsylvania here. Ooh, thank you Pennsylvania. So find a comfortable position, keep your eyes open or closed whatever you need. Awareness of the body and mind really supports us as we pay attention to new learning. So let's take a deep breath in. and out. And as we take a deep breath in, maybe think about all that you are grateful for today in this present moment. And out. And I see um, our powerhouse Surge is here. Go Surge, woo, woo, woo. Deep breath in. and out. Thank you for being present. Thank you for grounding in. And a che another check-in question, just a community builder, as I like to call them, is sometimes we do get out of balance like I did this morning. So what do you do to regain that balance, right? To go from not so emotional, logical brain to just trying to be a little bit of who you are. So please put in the chat if you want to be vulnerable and brave to share out to our new community. And as Jeff knows, uh, I love to go swimming. And since the pools are closed right now, um, Mills pool is closed and I'm so sad about that. I have taken up running to regain my balance. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, taking a walk, running. We could go running together, step outside, yoga, cooking, looking out of the water. Ooh, soil, yes. 
And thank you for just taking a moment to be brave and really connecting with our community. Oh, thank you. So as we transition into our new learning, this is me, I was so cute. And now I have all these like wrinkles and everything. I don't know what happened. Uh, if you had the pleasure of seeing Kareem Weaver, he taught me to always ground yourself in your why, like why you do the work that you do. Why do you wake up every day and continue to move forward? And that's me when I was so cute. I went into formal schooling, speaking Spanish and French. And you would think, right, like, wow, this kid knows Spanish and French. That's awesome. And now they're going to learn English. So they're going to be speaking three languages. Awesome. Like, let's build off that asset. Yet teachers were not very nice to me. Like my Spanish and my French were seen as burdens and they were seen as a deficit compared to like that asset base that I really want to instill in educators today. So this is my why, and I am guided and grounded every day to really support little ones and build off their asset, like come with everything you are in your class, in the classroom, and let's build from that. So that's my why. I'm going to put us into small breakout rooms. When you go into small breakout rooms, I know sometimes it's awkward because we're on Zoom. Just pretend we're in person and you see someone and you're like, oh, cool shoes, right? Like those, those social things that we would do that we can't do anymore. Um, talk about why you do the work that you do every day. Get to know each other. You'll be in your small groups for five minutes. As I stop my share and get our breakout rooms ready, I love singing transition songs and transition songs definitely support dual language learners, emergent bilinguals, whatever emergent bilinguals, dual language learners is the title that I like to use. So think about um, the why you do the work you do every day. And we'll go dos manitas, diez deditos, dos manitas, diez deditos. Five minutes. Dos manitas, diez deditos, cuéntalos conmigo. Uno, dos, tres deditos, cuatro, cinco, seis deditos, siete, ocho, nueve deditos, uno más son diez. Five minutes. Okay, Jethro, keep time me for five minutes. Thank you, I think. I'll give you the shout out at, uh, yeah, maybe I shouldn't join. Okay. The breakout, so I can give you the shout out in five minutes. Okay. Hi, Angelica, Vanessa, and Celine. Do you wanna share why you do what you do? Hi, Celine. Hi, everybody. I just joined, I was finishing up a quick check-in with my school day team since we still have program today. So, um, to share why we do literacy or just why we're here today why or do, why you do what you do every the day work that you do yeah um well for me uh it is deeply rooted in like my own experience as being a newcomer and being a uh, english language learner and having um had teachers and instructors and after school program um as a support in my educational journey and really having a, a, a big impact on like the trajectory of like where I am today <laughs> basically and like the supports that I got as a third grader when I first moved to the U.S. were just primal to my success I feel in my journey on through education and higher education so that's why I am now the literacy specialist for Girls Inc. of Alameda County and I was also a classroom teacher for four years. Awesome thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if Vanessa's here. Vanessa? Yeah, she just, uh, they just came Hi, back. Sorry, I got kicked out. Welcome back. Oh, okay. Thank you, Vanessa. Woo! Yeah. Okay, um, cool. <laughs> Jethro, do you want to share? Um, yeah, so um, literacy is really important to me. Um, it's how I experience, you know, different worlds growing up. And I've just seen you know, just from the beginning of life to older stages, just how much it opens up the world for folks. When I first got to Oakland, I was both um, working with uh, preschool students and also working in the juvenile justice system. And I really like at one school I was at, I saw these kids lined up and very strict, like hands behind your back and move forward and don't get out of line. 
And I would see the same thing like at the JJC and it just was, you know, just sort of shook me that like we need to kind of break these chains. And I, I feel like language and learning is a way to do that. Um, and my own experience in learning another language also just made me kind of realize how constricted your, your thinking is when you're thinking in one language. Um, so mm -hmm. those, those things are really why I want to, um, you know, not just promote English literacy, but just literacy overall for, for our children and for adults as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Did, what's our time? I don't know if Vanessa... um, we got like two minutes uh, Vanessa, the prompt was just like, why do you do the work that you do? Yeah, um, I would say, I think the thing that comes to mind the most for me as I've gotten older um, from when I was a kid, I was a gifted student and a gifted reader. And so I really, you know, want to recognize and have been able to recognize that privilege that I've had. Um, in terms of educational access and, you know, my own skill levels and the, the way that I was able to experience uh, school in particular, but, and, and reading and literacy um, as well. And so I really feel like, you know, as someone who's committed to elevating and fighting for social change um, in any way I can, I, this is a foundational way to do so, so that other people you know that kids and and uh, students can have the access to reading um, as a like a foundational skill for everything else that they need to do. Yeah, awesome. Thank, Thank you, you for sharing, Vanessa. Yeah, I'm gonna bring them back. Okay, thanks. Thank you, welcome back. Hello, welcome back. Thank you for being here. Thank you for coming back. I'm gonna give it one more second as I share my screen. I think we have about 10 more people coming in. Thank you, Paige, Polly, welcome back. We could keep singing. Dos manitas, yes, deditos. Dos manitas, yes, deditos. Dos manitas, yes, deditos. Cuéntalos conmigo. And then we go, we're bilingual, right? So two little hands, 10 little fingers, two little hands, and <laughs> little fingers, two little hands, 10 little fingers, count them with me. It's always really helpful just to think about the different languages in your classroom and how you can sing them or learn those different songs that maybe they're, the children are singing at home. Welcome back. I wanted to announce that we, Fluent Seeds, used to be maybe you've heard Seeds of Learning, Cares for Learning, and now we are called Fluent Seeds. So I represent Fluent Seeds today and thank you for being here. The impact of Fluent Seeds is amazing. And if you love coffee as much as I do, can you read this out loud for us? All right, I'll do it. Yeah, woo -woo, thank you. <laughs> this is my fourth cup now. Uh, the results from the, from the California study, or the CA study, I'm assuming that's California, show that children acquired gains equivalent to up to eight months of additional learning. Positive outcomes were seen for children in all racial ethnic subgroups, as well as for dual language learners. These results are comparable to some of the most recognized pre-K programs in the nation, such as Tulsa, Boston, and Georgia. Yes, so thank you. Seeds, seeds or fluent seeds is in all of the pre-K, not pre-K, I'm sorry, all of the TK classrooms within OUSD. If you know seeds or fluent seeds, you could put a little heart emoji. We have some people representing fluent seeds in another panel tomorrow. And seeds, we really believe in seeds qualities, which is sensitivity, encouragement, education developed through doing and self image, right? Thinking about those seeds qualities. And no matter what language you speak, you want 
to show your children that you are sensitive, encouraging, education, and always creating an image of confident and capable little learners. Then the other hand that we have often is those five early literacy predictors. These five early literacy predictors trans, uh, translate into any language that you're learning. So we have language development, phonological awareness, we have print, we have alphabet knowledge and vocabulary. So those are two hands that within SEEDS always work together. If you wanna know more about SEEDS, uh, our website is up on the board. And if you have a child that went to TK or maybe in some preschools that has SEEDS or fluent SEEDS, you might've heard them sing these songs. And these songs we know are super important to help with transitions. They help with language development. And it's really a technique. Someone put a question up, like what is a technique I can use to help my language learners? And songs, right? We think of songs all the time, like I don't want to age myself, but I still think of commercials like I could just start singing a commercial from back when I was little, because that song is ingrained into my memory and just within seeds, we always are promoting and singing songs so you'll hear me sing a lot. People say I have a voice like Beyonce so if you want to sing with me, please go ahead. And if you don't know who Beyonce is in Spanish people have said that I sound like Shakira so. Please feel free to sing with me today. Today's topic is really thinking about how children and families engage in finding print and books that mirror them, that mirror their experiences, while also supporting language development. So we know that the more mirrors we create in our classrooms means that the more children will see themselves. They'll have a sense of love, a sense of language, a sense of like, wait, I belong here, right? And we think about historically, uh, and I'll show you, historically, we've seen that about 50% of books that children see represent white characters, represent uh, a lot of characters where there's so much privilege for white dominant culture, yet we're not seeing that diversity in books. So we as educators, we as partners within Oakland, we can make those changes, right? We can do something to disrupt this. And as Dr. Moore said yesterday in one of our questions, what are we doing in our classrooms to disrupt this? One tiny little thing you can do is just making sure that we have books that represent our communities to show mirrors. And can you guys imagine there's more books about animals as the main characters than Latinos? And I also want to uplift Dr. Bishop. Okay, if you don't like coffee and you prefer tea, can you read this quote? Or water? Books are sometimes windows offering views of worlds that may be real or imagined, familiar or strange. These windows are also sliding glass doors and the readers have only to walk through the imag in imagination to become part of whatever world has been created or recreated by the author. When lightning, lighting conditions are just right, however, a window can also be a mirror. Thank you, and I see that you're eating, so I appreciate you for reading this quote while you're eating. Thank you, buen provecho, buen appetit. So we want to create uh, mirrors. We want to create windows to where children see themselves, because if you see themselves and you're learning language, it's going to promote this asset-based thinking, and it's going to start disrupting this negative um, lack of diversity in our books that we have today. And as we move forward, we think about like book choice makes a difference within seeds, within fluent seeds, within our classrooms. And we want as many different book choices as possible to really represent our communities. Um, I say this with love that sometimes you have Latino books. Yeah, oh, I have lots of Latino books and all the characters are Latinos. And then the story is about making tortillas and tamales. And we have to also remember that Latino kids are not making tortillas and tamales every day. Right, so thinking about how do we move and just represent people as people that maybe are scientists, that are maybe, if you see the book in behind me, a child who's first day of school, right? Really thinking about those book choice and being super intentional about the types of books that we present for our families and for our children as we move forward. 
I see someone put maybe something in the chat. I don't know. Oh, yes. Such a great quote. I love it. So thinking about how we can create mirrors and how we can create windows so that children are seen and represented. Oh, yes, that's a good one. Thank you for sharing that. Here are some examples. Uh, just as children as children, right? We want to represent that. We want to choose those books intentionally. Here are some other two. And Seeds has these amazing books for you. Also, I know within Oakland, there are so many people that have books and that give away amazing books. So we have such a great resource. So now I'm thinking, okay, I have these great books. I understand. I want to represent my children. Now, what are the next steps? How do I approve, like continue to have access and really strong techniques? So within Seeds, we talk about an effective read aloud because we know that for language learning and for language support, that an effective read aloud will increase language. And whether that language is you're in a dual immersion program, you're in a 50, 50, 90, 10 or English only, when you do effective interactive read alouds, children are going to be learning language. And, oh, thank you, Jethro. I'm not gonna look at the chat. So uh, children are actively engaging and answering questions. And we are supporting them with scaffolds to be able to actively answer questions. Research, I think five years ago was saying, you know, pre-K teachers, they talk a lot, but I don't hear the kids talking. Like there's no opportunity for the children to talk. So we really want to support children asking questions. And if it's something as simple with my awesome book that I have, what do you see in the cover? And a pre-K three-year-old might see it, say, girl, Oh, awesome. You did see a girl that, you know, yes, they might be a girl and the girl expanding the language and giving advanced language. Oh yeah. And there's a purple headband. Do you have a headband? No. Oh, okay. What else do we see? Tell someone next to you because we really want to encourage that language and actively asking questions. They're hearing us read, right? We are, we are active readers. We are fluent readers and they want to be able to hear that. Also a repeated read aloud has several different parts of the book and we really want to encourage them to have connections throughout the classroom. So if they're seeing this book, then maybe have it throughout their dramatic play area. Also vocabulary and definitions, we'll get into that in a little bit. Vocabulary and definitions are included and introduced throughout the day and illustrations are described. I'm gonna pause for a second. That was a lot of information. What comes to the top of your brain? And please feel free to unmute yourself or put it in the chat. I like really interactive uh, trainings. Yes, ooh, yes, librarians could help. So think about an effective read aloud. How would it be different from maybe what you're doing now or maybe what you've seen? Hi, I can make a comment. Um, yeah, thank you. I, my name is Lola Day. I'm a children's librarian at Oakland Public Library. Um, we do a lot of read alouds, like mostly for the zero to five age group, but we also will um, do read alouds with uh, like our elementary age school kids. And um, the third note that you have uh, where um, children can retell and dramatize is really important for us. I think like when we're doing our storytelling, we try to get it you know, very exciting for everyone in the room, whether it's kids or the grownups that are there with them. Um, but I do, it's, it's helpful for me to remember that the kids can also help dramatize. So I like that you put that in there. Yes. And kids loving, love, love doing that, right? I could only imagine they want to come up and point to the pictures and pretend they're the characters in the book. And that helps create that whole body learning and interaction that some kids need. Other kids might not need that, but when you are working with dual language learners that maybe don't understand some words yet or in, are emerging in those skills, to be able to retell and dramatize it helps that. Any other comments? What feels most natural? Hmm, that's a great question. 
And we do ask our participate, uh, people who participate, what is something that feels most natural and what is something that you maybe need to work on? Well, think about it. And we have, a, we have some time at the end of this, today's session to go over questions or comments. So in seeds, the cool thing is that we have something that's called a repeated read aloud. In OUSDs or other schools, they might call it a spiral reading. And a repeated read aloud, we know like evidence, research-based, it makes a difference. Because when you read a book one time, okay, I'm brand new, I just read this book, I might only use the word enough one time. I have 10% maybe using that word. If I were to read it three to five times, there's an 80 to 90% chance that I'm going to use that word more than others. What do, you, what do people think about that? When I first heard this, I'm gonna be honest, and I know Emily's on here. I was like, oh, no, 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 no. As an educator, I am not reading the same book five times. I'm like, my little ones are gonna be running up and down the, like, up and down the classroom. That doesn't sound right. Yet I, I did it and I learned that, oh, wait, just like adults, right? We have a book that we continuously read over and over again because we love it so much. Little ones also love hearing the same story over and over again. And uh, like kid, kids at the library, they love to hear the same book over and over again. I always give this example of one of my little ones. Um, she, we were reading Owl Babies. And for all the ones, people who love books, Owl Babies, there was a word swoop. So we introduced that vocabulary word swoop. And the child, we read it three to five times, the child would always use that word. And it had become ingrained in that vocabulary. Like, I'm going to swoop over to you and I'm swooping over here. And it was just very powerful. So yes, I, um, I see in the chat, a lot of people love certain books and they continuously read it over and over again. And we know that multiple readings of the same book, as it says, the research right there is going to significantly help language for language learners, for in dual language immersion, whatever language you are learning, reading the same book and practicing those vocabulary words are going to help our little ones. Okay, so we're not just reading the book with, over again and not being like super intentional. Remember, we are intentional. We pick books that represent our little ones. We wanna be mirrors. We wanna provide windows and mirrors for our little ones. And in Seeds, we have what we call a repeated read aloud where each day there's a different focus. So that way we are very intentional about what we are doing and the different instructional focuses each day. Day one, we talk about prediction. What does prediction mean? Can someone unmute? I would love to hear your voice. Like, what does that mean? What's going to happen next? Yeah, thank you for sharing your voice and being brave. What's going to happen next? So day one, we're only focusing on prediction. Day two, we're focusing on feelings like, oh, what, what do you think the character is feeling? What do you think? Why are they doing that? Day three, we're talking about concepts of print. So top to bottom, left to right. Day four, we kind of combine day three and four is also concepts of print. And then day five, we think about those vocabulary cards, vocabulary instruction, and vocabulary words that we introduce. And thank you. Jethro's checking the chat for me. If anything comes up, I see it's like, it's so on fire, which I love, but let me know if I need to pause anywhere. For our dual language learners, and again, if you're learning Arabic, Spanish, English, instruction on vocabulary words is really important as we support our little ones. So comprehension, word meaning, the larger part of vocabulary is understanding, associating, given, oh, sorry about that. People are coming in still. So understanding that vocabulary, choosing the vocabulary words before you start reading is very important to help the knowledge of the little ones. So within seeds, and this is something that you could do also, I know I see some librarians or preschool students and preschool teachers. So before you start reading the book, you're gonna look over it and think about three targeted vocabulary words that maybe children might not understand, 
They also like new words that are really critical to understanding the story. And then words that you could use throughout the day. So remember we talked about, we wanna dramatize it. We wanna retell it. We maybe wanna put it in the dramatic play area. So if I have this book, I'm gonna pick, and that's funny because my words fell. Sorry, I'll be right, I'm right here. So I picked, before I start reading, I picked student and son. And these are the words that I thought, okay, they might need to know this word. And then they might also need to understand what is enough, right? That understanding of enough. Within learning to read and within understanding and comprehension, we want our little ones to feel successful, right? If I am reading this book, and as adults, if we're reading Shakespeare, I didn't like reading Shakespeare, but if you're reading Shakespeare and you have to read a sentence and you pause and you're like, oh, what does that word mean? Oh, I have to look it up on Google or back in the day we had dictionaries, right? Like, what does that word mean? Go and look it up. You read a little bit more, pause. I don't know what that word means. Well, let's look it up again. So the more that we're pausing, we're not gaining that fluency. We're not gaining the comprehension skills. So as you're reading to the little ones, and you've introduced those three words, they will grasp the story better to and understand it without having to stop. What does it mean to soar? I don't, I don't know that, but teacher had already introduced the word soar. So thinking about those very explicit vocabulary instructions to help our little ones be able to go uh, and just understand and grasp the story. Here is an example of like you could do this at home uh, with Influence Seeds. We provide books and we also provide the cards. Um, as dual language learners, we look for cognates also. And cognates are, does anybody want to say? Jeopardy. Do, no, 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 no. Words that sound the same in English and another language. <laughs> Can you give me an example? Oh man, there's so many. Um, What's the first one that comes to mind? Like carro. Uh -huh. Carro, like, car. And yeah. Thank you. And mm -hmm. so thinking about when you are learning a different language and our little ones, right? We are the ones that bridge that knowledge together. So chocolate, chocolate. Ooh, how do you say chocolate in Mandarin? And then they are able to say that. If we have the pictures, right? Sun, how do you say sun in mom? Ir, I, I love that. Like, I was like, oh, that's awesome. So we are providing the, the bridge and also ensuring that our children feel like assets to be able to share their language and whatever it is, right? So English shares very, very few cognates with a language like Chinese, yet 30 to 40% of English has related words to Spanish and French and like Latin languages. So it, I know it sounds like it's hard to learn all the cognates, yet as we, as you said in the beginning, as we learn languages, it's really helpful to point out those cognates and even make like a cognate voice. Um, uh, sorry, I don't, I'm going to try G throw. Okay. So thinking about cognates, everyone put a cognate into the chat. If you could think of one and I'm going to try to help G throw with something real quick. Telefono, I love it. Doo -doo -doo. This is a good moment for a transition song, right? It only allows you to make a host. Is that what you want, Jethro? Uh, you should be able to make me yes. a host and I can make you a co-host again. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Welcome. If you're just coming in and I lost your name, sorry. So I'm thinking of Cognitz. So I'm making you host. Okay. I'll make you co-host. The power of Zoom and the hosts. Good? Yeah, still we're okay. I had been told it was fixed, but it's still the same. I'm going to make you host again. Well, I'm still sharing, right? So, yeah, you're still sharing. Awesome. Thank you. 
Okay, I'm gonna just a little football back and forth behind the scenes. Awesome, thank you everyone for your support and your patience as we get Zoom right. So when you're reading out loud to your students, maybe if you have Spanish speakers, mom speakers, Mandarin speakers, ask them to like, if they hear a word that sounds like sun, like, oh, how do you say that in your language? Tell me a little bit more, difícil, oh yeah, that's nice. Uh, tell me about it. And then you can make a list to really support just that your dual language, uh, dual language is an asset and should be seen as assets. Okay. As we get everything ready and you have your Zoom, I think most of us are at home. Yes, thumbs up. Yes, we're not gonna get into small breakout groups. I do want you to, I'm gonna give you two seconds to find a book and it could be an adult book. It could be a child book. It could be any type of book. I want you to find a book. Ashley's looking for a book. Oh, good. I saw her, I saw Ashley get up. Ooh, Annabelle, can I, that looks so good. Find a book, find a book. Hello, welcome. If you are driving, do not find a book, okay? Be safe. We are not liable. So everyone has a book. I want you to pause, think about, you're in the office, that's okay. You have Oakland Zoo books. Uh, think about, go through your book. What are three words that you might pull out for either an adult or child that are like, these words are necessary to know before I continue to read or else it's gonna stop and it's gonna pause. So, and if anyone, I'll give you like three minutes to look through a book. And people are having a party like on my block, if you could hear that music. You're too lucky. Let me know if you ever want me to bring the music back. Okay. For these interstitials. Would anyone like to share out maybe some vocabulary that they would introduce to their little ones? And you could do this with your own children, your niece, nephew, whatever you like. Can you repeat the question, Bernadette? Hi, Dulce. What is up? Dulce is here. Okay, now really the party has started if Dulce is here. Thank you. Um, Dulce, did you find a book? Okay, Dulce has a book. So Dulce, oh, because you came in a little bit later. So we said that when little ones, dual language learners are trying to understand a new book, it's always great to have uh, explicit vocabulary instruction before we start reading. And Dulce, I, I always think about Shakespeare in high school. Like I had to read it and then I had to pause. Like, I don't know what that means. Go look for it in a dictionary. Read a sentence, pause, go look for it in a dictionary. So to support our language learners, when we have that targeted explicit vocabulary and intentional at the beginning, we're helping our children just love the story, not pause, and just build that comprehension. So Dulce, what are some three words that you might introduce your, to your son, to your children before you start reading? Um, oh, go, 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 no, no, go Dulce, do it. All right, uh, so how about climate, mm -hmm. um, survive, and uh, creature? Ooh, I love it. Those are good, right? Because climate, you're reading a story, the child might say, what is climate? And by the time they go, what is climate? The teacher kept reading everything else, right? And I'm lost now. So really being explicit about that language instruction, we always recommend three words, okay? So if you're trying to explain climate, that might be a little hard, but we tr try to do it in three words for our little ones. So the next step, is all of you, Margaret, put guest. I hear rumpled, burns, glows, rely, earth. Try to explain one of those words in three in three words. You could do it, Dulce. You could do it. 
<laughs> I'm sorry. What was it? what was it again? <laughs> Dulce um, is try to explain that definition. Give a definition of the word in three words. Oh, the definition of of, of climate. Um, I could say. So I'm 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 thinking. Um, how's um how does the weather feel? Oh no, you say three words. Okay. Um, That's cool. That's good. Sometimes it's hard with just three words, but that was awesome. Okay. I'll provide an example. So this one's climb. And this one comes from the book, I am enough. So for a little one, I'm going to say climb. And right, we want that whole body movement. Everyone climb. And the definition is to crawl upward. So three words and it helps kids. Oh, to climb, crawl, climb up or crawl upward. So think about it. Gobble, eat fast. Oh, I love it. I love it, Angelica. Thank you. Weather outside. Good, Ashley. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, we'll take one more minute. If anyone wants to share out maybe their definition. Okay. Well, when we have this explicit vocabulary instruction, we want to prepare being that intentional. We find those words that are going to support our little ones. That way they are fluent in the story. They're not pausing every two seconds. Before reading the book, we would give the definition of the words and the, those three words. I have these fancy cards, but these could be made at home. These could be made in your classroom, whatever you want. I remember I did um, explicit vocabulary instruction on Cesar Chavez because I wanted to talk about Cesar Chavez book and I wanted to talk about them as a leader, yet I didn't have the book, so I created these cards and had to explain boycott. Can you imagine the power when the child comes home and is like, mom, dad, I learned the word boycott. And then boycott means to protest against blah, blah, blah. And they're like, oh, that is awesome. Yes, great. So then you have those before reading, you have during the reading, we're gonna be pointing out those new words. If Dulce is reading about climate, Dulce is like, climate, oh, that's our new word. Remember what climate means? Climate means, and her definition, I'm sorry, Dulce, what was the definition? I like Ashley's, uh, weather okay. outside. The weather outside, oh yeah, climate. Well, we learned a new word, right? We pointed out during the reading the whole time. And then after the reading, we want to model it and say it fast again, review. It's always good to review, right? Even for us as adults. And so I'm gonna show a video. It's kind of funny because it's me and I don't really like showing videos of me. I'm so embarrassed. Um, and it's a good example of like, I'm not just encouraging us to do this, but I'm actually doing it myself in classrooms. So enjoy the video. These are with three and four-year-olds, and we're doing the vocabulary instruction before starting the, the book. Good morning. We have a new book today. What is it? I know. Before we start reading our new book, we always have three new words. Yay! The first word is enough. You say it. Enough. enough. My turn. When nothing else is needed. Thank you for repeating the definition. I'm going to put our new special word up here, okay? Enough. My turn. Sore. Your sore. turn. Sore. Wow, I heard everyone's voices. Sore means to move high in the air. You say it. My turn. To move high in the air. They're sore. My turn. Worth. Your turn. How much something matters. How much something matters. Wow, your voices are so amazing. Thank you. Okay, pause. What did you see? What did you feel? I see a heart. I see affirmations. Repetition. Mm -hmm. I like how you... Um, you know, like you're encouraging them to not only say the word, but also the definition, like that call and response, like just practicing saying, saying the new word. Mm -hmm. Pausing, giving space. Yeah. Student friendly definitions, three words only. Visual images. Mm -hmm. 
So the beauty of these vocabulary words is that by the end of the day, we're practicing them, not just in the story, we are practicing them throughout the whole day. So at, by three o'clock when kids go home, they're like, hey, guess what, caregiver? I learned enough worth and soar, watch me soar. So their language is just growing. And these still, like if you are in a dual immersion classroom and learning Spanish, these skills can be also done in Spanish, or like I said, any type of language, any language that you're teaching, because we want to give them those tools and strategies. When I do this in Spanish, we also have the Spanish words, I'm like, oh, I didn't know that definition. And I am learning too. And as in English, I'm learning what sore means in different words. The kids love just learning. Uh, within also this whole the sequence of reading and repeated read alouds, we give a book introduction. So really powerful book introduction is always going to introduce the title, the illustrator, we give the child always the opportunity to talk about what do you think this book is going to be about? And they might not, they might not know, but we're allowing them to try and ask questions, right? We're introducing the main problem of the book and giving children the look fors and listens. At the beginning of your day one in your repeated read aloud, it's really, really teacher heavy. And then we gradually release, right? And by day five or day three or four, because fire drills happen and COVID shutdowns happen. So by day three, four, we're like, oh, can you remind me who's the author? Who's the illustrator? What do they do? What was this book about? And we are providing those opportunities for the little ones to talk, to engage. Oh, Jethro, you tell Ashley what your favorite part of the book was. And Ashley, do you remember what happened here? So we're providing that language, giving the scaffold, and then gradually releasing to the child. So that's your book introduction. And throughout day one, like I said, each day has a different focus. In day one, we're making predictions. What do you think is gonna happen next? Um, what do you know? Like, what makes you think that? And just looking at how many, all of it, I think, oh, I'm thinking of my dissertation and things like that. And the first thing people always say, is, cite your work, right? Cite your work and where is this from? Where, why are you saying that? So if you were to look at this picture, and you ask the child, what do you think might happen next? And a child, what might a child say just looking at this picture? He's gonna fly. Yeah, he's gonna fly. Ooh, thank you for saying that. You are using the image to support your idea. So we're setting up our little ones to cite their cite their evidence, right? As we continue to move forward and always like, where, how do you know that? Where does it come from? Supporting your claim, right? What in the picture makes you think that, Jethro, that they're going to fly? And so helping them see the pictures and being able to I, like be ready to cite work as we do in school. Um, any questions about the making predictions or book inter? introductions I have a question yeah hi I miss you go sama sama I love repeated read alouds I think it really quenches my thirst to go deeply into a book um I I tend to maybe overdo the beginning sometimes time wise uh, so I'm curious what your thoughts are around just how to make it um, the right amount of size and content. How do you know what's enough and not too much? Yeah, you will always know your children and your community best. So I always leave it up to you as, as a community member. Like, you know, if your kids are only going to get one page because they're like want to jump and soar themselves, then that happens. In regards to the context, are you asking like how many questions or? Um, yeah, I don't know if you have just a rule of thumb. And I guess one one thing is, you know, how, how quickly kids will just get <laughs> busy, <laughs> too busy. But just what's what's what what feels like, what are some rule of thumbs you have for what feels like the right amount of content to cover it in an intro? Mm -hmm. um, so I I do like just the main problem of the book. 
and then throughout the book every page so i might say oh in this book is about uh, a little girl who loves herself and just one sentence and then throughout the book i try to add movement so here, like the rain, I pour and drip and fall because for our little ones who are learning English, pour, everybody pour and drip, right? And fall. So each page has a movement and pointing throughout the book to really support the like understanding. Oh, they're pooling. Everybody pool, 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 pool. And then so by day five, they're like, oh, remember this one? And then they're all pooling together. They're all making those movements and really incorporating that whole body movement, that whole child learning. And then um, throughout the book, if my focus is predictions, I think I would do three prediction questions. And then maybe after one, and they're like, oh, rah, rah, rah. I'm like, oh, okay, so we did one, we're good, right? You know your community. There's some kids oh, in some classrooms, I would have done like a prediction question each, each page and other kids are like, oh, just do one. And you know, you're, you know them the best. Thank you for that question. And then we have the summarizing at the end, uh, just being like, okay, at the beginning, this happened in the middle and in the end. Day one, you might be heavy teacher heavy or parent heavy, and then by the end, day five, okay, we did it. Now, who could tell me what happened at the beginning, at the end, in the middle? And the, again, you're giving that language scaffold to support their little ones to feel confident and capable throughout. And I wanted to pause here. Think about your book, okay? Everyone got a book, maybe an adult book. If you're in your office, don't worry. Okay, Jethro has a book too, I see it. Think about how would you introduce your book? And if anyone feels so brave and vulnerable to, to introduce their book, go for it. I don't have a book, but one of the things I do for my read alouds is sometimes play a game. So um, if we're talking about, I'll use your book, I'm Enough. Um, we may say, if you ever heard of the game, like hands up to 85, we can go around the circle and see how many quotes the kids can say, or if it's a, um, the day the crayons quit, then you'll say, um, how many colors can we um, help come up with or something like that to kind of get the kids to understand what the concept of the book may be about, even if it's not on target, maybe just introduce the topic. So um, just stuff like that. So maybe play a game to introduce the book. Awesome. Thank you. I love that idea. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jorge. Um, um, I think that introducing the story is essential to learning the story. So in, in my generation, I'm a little older, uh, we would talk about uh, Mike Mulligan's steam shovel or make way for ducklings. And to talk about, has anybody gone to the petting zoo? Has anybody seen this particular uh, uh, a pet or a little animal or creature? And so uh, by making some kind of a brief connection and then, well, I have a story about these little ducklings and then go into the story. So you've created a little bit of drama, interest, and now you can start with the magic words of once upon a time. Then it has, uh, has that special connotation. Thank you. Thank you, I love it. And it makes me think about uh, that knowledge, building on the prior knowledge and background of the little ones. So yeah, awesome. And I've seen, I've been in a lot of classrooms lately. So there's like, that knowledge, like, what do you know about, I guess I am enough, or what do you know about this topic? And then what questions do you have? And then how do you know it? And how did we learn it is that final step. So thank you for that. Okay. If you feel so inclined to like introduce your book to us and share out, let me know, we're here. So then we'd go for summarizing. And thank you Jorge for laughing at my jokes. Then we love songs. Remember I said at the beginning, we love songs. We are always singing because songs help us click, right? Songs help those neurons connect and we remember things. So here I have 
three words. I introduced them at the beginning. I made sure I called them out throughout the story. And then at the end, we sing, help me sing if you want. How fast can we go? How fast can we go? We'll take turns saying words we know. How fast can we go? And the kids love it because they always try to like win the teacher or win the parent. So me first, okay? Always you first because we do not like flashcards. We do not believe in flashcards. We always introduce. We want our children to feel confident and capable. So me first, okay? This is son. This is student and climb. I already introduced these words. We've been pointing it throughout the whole book. And then we ask the kids to do it. So they would say, son, student, climb, yay. And remember, we're introducing three new words each day. So by day five, how many words is that? Who can do the math fast? Go, 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 yeah. do it. Woo, yeah. Okay, Jeopardy, good job. Um, yes, so it would be 15 new words that they can use throughout their day, that they are learning, that they are practicing, not just one day, but through the whole week, because we are really intentional educators. We wanna increase that vocabulary development and use. When we say those words fast, we are increasing the fluency and that rapid automatic naming. We know that fluency is really important because us as adults, right, when we read, we, we sometimes see a word and we don't have to have any type of cognitive or mental effort. We just read, right? That's the fluency that we want to create for our little ones. And then also rapidly automatic naming. That means we're, it's the ability to say things fast without pausing. And like, I can clearly read my name and tell you all the letters of my name and not have to pause. So we in fluency, we really want to support that fluency, rapid automatic naming to go from learning how to read to being very fluent readers by third grade. Uh, like I said at the beginning, we always want our little ones to talk. So at the end of the story, we think about, it's called the think pair share, where at the end, we might ask a question like, Jorge, what was your favorite part of the book? And something super simple. Okay, I model it first. My favorite part was blah, blah, blah. Turn and tell someone next to you. And we're providing those opportunities for the little ones to talk, to share their feelings. And this sometimes is, is hard when we first start. And as we continue to build that confidence and that routine, children quickly are like, hey, tell me, Ashley, what was your favorite part? Oh, yeah, I like this part because blah, 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 blah. And then they're using those new vocabulary words also. When you build your confidence in another language, we ask open-ended questions, closed questions, and just are continuously building from the skills of our little ones. I wanted to share, this is like just a model of days one through five. So we have that instructional focus, what we do every day, and that gradual release. Remember, it might be really teacher heavy day one. And then by day five, they're reading the book to you and they're asking the questions and they're like, teacher, you forgot think, pair, share. Oh, we have to do how fast can you go? And they feel confident and capable, just like we want for our little ones. I'm going to stop here. I would like to appreciate all of you for being here, for choosing me. I know uh, there's there's so much knowledge and so much love and brilliance in Oakland. And thank you again for Jethro and the funders, the creators who um, brought this all together. And lastly, that's me. I will be changing emails soon. So if you need anything, that is my email. Feel free to text me. I'd love to come into your classroom, train, talk, um, anything. So thank you for this opportunity. And stay because we have some like questions and comments. I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you so much for a really, really fantastic read aloud session. Um, I learned a lot. Thank you so much, Bernadette. Um, and on behalf of the OLC, thank you. Um, we do have some time, we have about 10 minutes. So I'd like to open it up for questions. There was one question I saw that was, um, so what ages do you recommend for these methods? Yes. Um, so Based on research that we've done within seeds, fluent seeds, we start at three 
at three years old. And as parents, we also like, you can introduce vocabulary before you read to your little ones. So as, as we work with zero to three, you can say, oh, we're going to read this book. I am enough. Enough means blah, blah, blah. Right. So we're giving that advanced language to our little ones, whatever your home language is, please continue to use it at home. And um, the more we know that the more the stronger the home language, the easier it is to bridge and transfer into other languages. Oh, great question from the library. Um, so would you recommend reading the same book twice with us within a single story time? Because you don't often have those chances to see kids more than once. Margaret, I think that's a great question. I have seen some beautiful librarians, and I think that what the librarians do is read it in a theme. So I know that if we're working on feelings, you have some feeling words up, you read Elephant and Piggy, which I adore. And then we also have another book about feelings. I think that that is enough that I think that would be beneficial for your little ones. I would not read the same book twice in one single story time because it, it, I think, I, I don't know the community as well. I think that the kids might be like, again? Yeah. Unless they're like, yes, I wanna read it again. Can we read it again? Then good. And just introduce the words and have your theme. I think, yeah. I think a lot of those same words will come up again in similar <laughs> themes. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to uh, encourage folks to make sure you do the evaluation before you leave. If you have to jump off early, please um, let us know you know, what we can do to improve. We always appreciate that. Um, I also wanted to uh, shout out to Kira for her. She said that in her read alouds, she reads it she, just for the first week, she reads it a different way each day. So I think that's great. You know, it sounds like she's already incorporating some of those lessons. So. Wait, Annabelle is here. I just real Annabelle is like famous. That's like the, one of the most famous librarians. If you have not had the opportunity to see Annabelle live, like that is a whole YouTube channel right there. Annabelle is so, so amazing. And Annabelle, I thought of you with that question that Margaret had, because I saw Annabelle, she starts off with a song. Then there's a first book, second book, and another song. And it is all theme related movement, lots of beauty. Annabelle, if you have not seen Annabelle, please go see her, her read aloud time. It is just I, I feel so honored. There's a you. Chavez library, right? Anna yes. Are you Actually, starting tomorrow, I'm going to be at the King Branch. Okay. So, yes. They are lucky to have you. So let me pose a question for uh, the folks out there. Um, you know, like looking at all that we went through, you know, what are the, of these tips resonate for you? And, you know, what do you think you might approach differently in your work after hearing this? And feel free to just unmute yourself popcorn style. I'd like to, I like the variety of approaches because you're using all the modalities. Uh, one of the big criticisms on, on this ongoing battle between whether we use phonics or a whole language or whatever the, whatever camp everybody's in, uh, the important thing is to be able to have that full spectrum of involvement using all, all our modalities, our kinesthetic, our hearing, our touching, our feelings. And so I think that to Bernadette's credit, she uh, uh, didn't call them that, those things in particular, but she ended up using uh, the full range of, because one of the things is that children will eventually learn what is their preferred learning modality. And this will help them even with their own self-concept of when people say, oh, I'm a visual learner. I need to hear that again. Can you draw me a picture? Uh, even today, uh, I was having trouble getting logging on and I asked uh, the people at Hoover to, can you send me the Play-Doh version of this application? And so I think it conveys the feeling that we always want to provide uh, information at, at least in one of our modalities. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. That was really powerful. Thank you for that, Jorge. Yeah. 
I just um, wanted to say the vocabulary instruction piece was very informative because I'm sometimes lost with um, sort of how to teach vocabulary, if that makes sense. I, you know, I might, I think I use too many words. I think how, you know, how am I going to explain this? So I think the, the idea of just a simple picture, a three word definition is very helpful. And we're, um, in our program, we're working with second and third graders who are reading at a PK level. So we are doing read alouds, um, with them. And, and I think though, that all of these strategies that you named are applicable to that age group. Um, it, the, the, um, hard part is finding high interest reading, <laughs> high interest books. That's like a universal problem, I think, for everybody. Um, but yeah, all these strategies are so helpful. And I really appreciate the vocabulary piece. Yeah. As a trilingual, I would have loved to know the vocabulary before starting an, any new book, right? Because I, I, I just value that so much. And for little ones, like, what does that mean? And then you st like your brain has to pause and be like, wait, 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 I'm trying to understand that word. And then I, I lost, oh, I lost the rest of the story because the teacher kept going. So I think it's really beneficial to introduce a vocabulary first always. And then I thought I saw another question in regards to in bilingual story time, would you highlight maybe two words in each language? Yeah, definitely. And I'm Margaret, I don't, Where's Margaret? Well, I would also make it very transparent, like, oh, we're going to learn in English. These are our words. Okay, now let's switch or change a channel or um, like change your cell phone setting. And because we don't change a channel like that anymore, right? So change your cell phone. Now, ahora vamos a hablar en español, right? So making it very concrete, especially for our little ones, like learning, like, oh, we said that in English and said that in Spanish. And then, like, bringing it back together for them. And can we get to this? I think a, 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 based on what you just said, Bernadette, a crucial thing is for us as the instructors to be, uh, to learn a few words in another language. Mm. Uh, when I was the vice principal at Garfield School, uh, it was the first generation of children coming in from Cambodia. So I made it an effort to learn three or four words. Good morning. I mean, I already knew it. I had previously done that with uh, uh, Cantonese. So I could say Josan, Nehoma, which is good morning. How are you? Didn't know any more than that. But it's the kind of thing that people, the kids run up to you after a while. Yeah. And so they, because you, it's an instant way to get trust learn a few words, even if you don't become an expert and you forget it. But, uh, I, I, uh, but I think learning just a half a dozen words to say good morning would probably be the best one in, in three or four languages, depending on what the kids are in your classroom, as, as was mentioned. Uh, and I also found that the kids who are learn who's you're learning the word that's not from their culture are more are the most excited about learning those other words. They really feel like they're uh, participating and, and part of a big family. Thank you. And just thinking about how, how they feel like their language is valued, right? Someone wants to learn my language and they're not only trying to teach me English, like actually I have a voice. So thank you for saying that. And also, it also uh, strikes me that as parents are dropping kids off, it also shows that commitment that you have to their child, which builds that relationship as well, and that commitment to the family. So, um, well, I want to thank everyone once again. Um, uh, does anyone just for last shout out want to tell me what they're looking forward to tomorrow? If you're joining us for a session tomorrow, I'm curious to know what folks are choosing. Just if anyone has any of those sessions tomorrow, or maybe you're choosing. Ah, the Oakland Reach session. Yes. Yeah. Parents in the driver's seat. That'll definitely be powerful. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that intervention is racist. Oh, yeah. Me too. More. Yeah, I think that's going to be like pretty powerful too. Um, well, 
I also encourage everyone to continue this conversation, reading in the brain. Yes, yes, how does the brain work? Mm -hmm. um, to continue these conversations in Whova, so you can start a chat, start a theme, um, a post, and we can share resources that way. You can also reach out to Bernadette directly into the um, email that she shared earlier. Um, if you can post that maybe one last time. Yes. Yeah, well, thank thanks. You. Thank you again, everyone. Have thanks a again. wonderful Friday. I think there's the next session is a closing out session. Yes, we're finishing with the closing plenary. Um, it's a very interesting conversation that we'll have for yes. our final bit of the day. And thank you once again for joining. And Jorge, I saw you last night. Thanks for joining that as well. Yes. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good day. See you soon. See you soon. I stopped recording. <laughs>